Well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? What do you mean? That's big. How does one? Not, what do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. With. There's Allison. Can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Uh -huh. <laughs> provides a window into this incredible cyberspace, this information space that's developing. And it allows you to simply, what we call net surf, looking for cool stuff. That's what the kids say they're doing. Hi there, readers. It's Chris with Deep Dive Books, the show where a librarian talks about books. Here in the 21st century, it's pretty easy to take the internet for granted. It surrounds us, penetrates us binds the galaxy together. But think back to the 1990s when the World Wide Web was brand new and just owning a personal computer was a bit of a flex. If you were around then, do you remember how baffling, how completely overwhelming it was to figure out email, websites, and chat rooms? Yeah, me neither. If you were a kid back then, getting online and learning the ropes was just like exploring a new playground. It was no more daunting than learning to move Mario around in three dimensions on the newly released Nintendo 64. You wanna see something really cool? Check this out! Kids are fast learners though, so it's understandable that many adults with their lesser neuroplasticity found this paradigm shift intimidating and bewildering. Nowhere in fiction was this disparity better exemplified than in a book written by a pair of senior citizens about children using the internet. Journey back to 1999 with me as we dive into The Berenstein Bears Lost in Cyberspace. I'm a huge fan of The Berenstein Bears, and if you're not, there's the unsubscribe button. Just kidding, that button doesn't do anything. Please subscribe to my channel. I could spend hours talking about the Berenstein Bears, but I'm sure they'll be featured in future episodes on this channel, so this video won't cover the entire Berenstein legendarium from stem to stern. Not that it would be possible to do that in a single video anyway. Since the big honey hunt in 1962, there have been hundreds of Berenstein Bear books, and the characters have been merchandised to an extent that rivals the likes of Garfield and Peanuts. Stan and Jan Berenstein produced so many books, in fact, that despite considering myself a dedicated fan, I freely admit I haven't even read half their catalog. Their work spans several distinct eras. In the early days, the character designs were a work in progress, Sister Bear hadn't even been born yet, and the books themselves served as basal readers with very little plot. The golden age of the 80s and 90s saw Mama, Papa, Sister, and Brother at the peak of their popularity, Happy Meal toys and cartoon shows and all. The modern age finds son Mike Berenstein at the helm, honoring his late parents' legacy and updating the franchise for a new generation. I know there's almost no chance Mike Berenstein will ever see this episode, but if he does, I hope he understands that all the razzing and joking ahead is all in good fun, and I sincerely love the Berenstein Bears. You do know that, Mike Berenstein, don't you? You're not going to seek revenge, are you? For my money, the core texts of the Berenstein canon were the square, soft-cover picture books published from the mid-80s into the late 90s. These were known as the first-time books. The back covers of these books showed what was pretty much the required reading list for Berenstein Bears 101. This period was the creative and commercial peak of the Berenstein universe, but it wasn't all sunny dirt roads and weird pointy smiles. Critics of the time panned the series for its moralizing tone and pedestrian art style. Conservative political commentator Charles Krauthammer was so provoked, he felt the need to write an editorial about it, harumphing, I hate the Berenstein Bears. But you know what? Books don't always have to be high art. If there's such a thing as literary comfort food, then the Berenstein Bears are chicken fried chicken at the Cracker Barrel. The first time books gently guided readers through many of life's common challenges. Stranger danger, peer pressure, capitalism, sexism, racism, childhood obesity, and so much more. Once you worked your way through that catalog of moral tutelage, you could graduate to the big chapter books, which Stan and Jan produced for maturing fans hungry for aged-up stories. Actually, while Stan and Jan received authorship credit for these books, it seems they served as creative consultants while their sons, Mike and Leo, actually wrote and illustrated the stories. The big chapter books, each clocking in at about 100 pages, were more plot-driven than their picture book predecessors. 
Whereas the first time books typically focused on mama, papa, sister, and brother, with occasional cameos from supporting characters, the big chapter books were ensemble productions that drew on characters from all over Bear Country, from Too Tall Grizzly to Bermuda McBear, from Ralph Ripoff to Mayor Horace J. Honeypot. Instead of five-minute bedtime stories, readers could now get their ursine literature fix through big juicy novels that might take a full hour to consume. These books, of course, were intended for older readers, so the Berensteins did their best to, you know, spice them up, give them a bit of an edge. The biggest and yet most ambiguous change is the age of all the characters. We actually do know the ages of brother and sister in the first time books. The Berenstein Bears and Too Much Birthday reveals that sister is six years old and brother is eight. In the big chapter books, it's clear they're meant to be older, but we never find out just how old. My best guess is 10 and 12. You can sort of extrapolate the ages of all the other characters from there. You might be wondering in what other ways the big chapter books cater to a more mature audience. Besides simply making the characters older, the Berensteins made sure to give them more mature attitudes, interests, and behaviors. Sister Lizzie and Queenie routinely self-identify as feminists, but rarely say or do anything to justify the label. The male characters are exclusively referred to as guys, because I guess it sounds a bit manlier than boys. What else? Uh, everyone is really into rock music? Excellent! There are also a few power couples, Brother Bear and Bonnie Brown, sort of, Too Tall Grizzly and Queenie McBear, and Ferdy Factual and Trudy Brunowitz. Although only this last relationship is officially boyfriend-girlfriend. In another departure from the first time books, the big chapter books scrapped the ham-fisted character education in favor of social commentary. Each installment tackled a hot-button issue, and it seemed nothing was off-limits. Bullying, dating, dress codes, environmentalism, due process, free speech, drug abuse, school shootings… yes, really. And of course, internet safety. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set, you're going surfing on the internet. The cubs of Teacher Bob's class arrive at school one morning to discover that each of them now owns a laptop computer. Teacher Bob explains that Bonnie Brown got a computer from her uncle, Squire Grizzly, and as a result, her grades have gone up. Squire Grizzly, the richest bear in bear country, has decided to donate laptops to every cub in Teacher Bob's class to see if their academic performance will receive a similar boost. This comes as a relief to Brother, who feels that Bonnie, his sort of girlfriend, has been distant lately. Brother realizes, Bonnie wasn't angry with him or anything. She'd been lost in cyberspace. What a relief, thought Brother. He was confident he could compete with a dopey laptop computer. By the way, all excerpts will be sourced from an audio recording I made of this book when I was in college. The sound quality is garbage, but the performance is just... But Brother shouldn't have been so confident. He and his whole group would soon find out that computers have a strange power. The power to pull cubs into another world. The world of cyberspace. And they would find out that it was a fascinating world. A world of endless information. A world of exciting computer games. A world that reached to the farthest ends of bear country. And if you weren't careful, sometimes it could be a world of deadly danger. This looks like someone asked your grandma to draw the internet after reading about it for the first time in a 200-word article from Reader's Digest. Internet. internet cyberspace. On-line. On dash dash Chat room. Information, information superhighway. Bear at net? What? What does that even mean? Hey look, the Berenstein Bears predicted Netflix. Cyber <laughs> cinema and chill, anyone? Teacher Bob sends his students home with their brand new laptops and no training whatsoever. And then, without any supervision at all, they log on to the internet and start doing whatever the hell they feel like. It's at this point, by peeking over Brother Bear's shoulder, that the reader gets a first-hand view of Bear Country's first Google search. 
He'd heard that you could type in a word and get all kinds of information about that word. The word brother was going to type in was... No, just kidding, it's sports. Well, if you thought the description of Google searching was exhilarating, wait until the Berenstein Bears explain chat rooms to you. Chat rooms were amazing things. They were imaginary rooms where you could enter and chat with anyone else in the room. You chatted by typing words and sentences which instantly appeared on the screen. And then others did the same thing and their words and sentences also appeared on the screen. There were all kinds of chat rooms. Sports chat rooms, science chat rooms, movie chat rooms, fashion chat rooms, chat rooms for just about anything you could think of. They're not kidding. Class bully Too Tall Grizzly comes to school the next morning raving about the Macho chat room, a place where future felons swap strategies for beating up nerds and dweebs. One of the cubs, Babs Bruno, goes to the Young Poets chat room and tries to register the screen name Puff, only to discover it's already been taken. Same with her second choice, Huff. Because she, and I suspect the Berensteins themselves, has never been online before, she finds it unbelievable that this could happen. She's so perturbed, in fact, that she begins monitoring Huff's and Puff's poems and discovers a criminal conspiracy. Huff and Puff, it turns out, are using the chat room to relay their plans for some kind of extortion scheme. Our plans are humming. The time is coming. He's had time enough. The time has come to Huff and Puff. Puff. Message received and understood. We're going to get SG and get him good. Huff. Babs somehow sets her printer to automatically print any other poems that are posted to the Young Poets chat room, and in the morning she finds evidence of a deadly plot. The time has come to deliver the note. Look out for the guards. Look out for the moat. Puff. We are ready. Ready to go. Ready and willing to strike our blow. Huff. So leave your package at the midnight hour. Hail, all hail, computer power. Puff. We will huff and puff and blow his house down. We will blow his house all over town. Huff. Babs brings the printouts to teacher Bob, who immediately bundles the entire class into his minivan and races across town to the police station. It turns out the cops are already on the case, and Police Chief Bruno has no qualms about sharing the details of this ongoing criminal investigation. Huff and Puff, he explains, have delivered a note to Squire Grizzly, threatening to blow up his mansion unless he gives them a million dollars. Teacher Bob wants to know why the suspects are using the internet to communicate. It's hard to say, said the chief. Maybe one of them is the mastermind and stays far from the action. Or maybe they're afraid of phone taps. You can't tap the internet. You can't tap the internet. Okay, but why are they using a public forum to discuss their plans to blow up Grizzly Mansion? That's like... That's like coordinating a terrorist attack through Amazon product reviews. Speaking of, I just want to check if my favorite underwear is back in stock. His show blows. I should punch his nose. He mocks my work. The time has come to get the jerk. MB. Huh. Weird. Who's MB? Anyway, thanks to the miracle of cyberspace, it's laughably easy to figure out who Huff and Puff really are. All Chief Bruno has to do is type the word extortionist into the crime database and then filter all the results by modus operandi, eliminating all but the bombers. By the way, can I just express how disappointed I am that Ugly Bear Johnson never got his own spin-off novel? Afterward, they bring up the aliases of all known extortionist bombers and discover that Lord Huffinpuff is none other than one J. Arthur Bruin. The crime computer has all the goods on this guy. Known whereabouts of subject. J. Arthur Bruin, a.k.a. Lord Huff and Puff, presently serving eight-year sentence at Bear Country State Prison for Extortion, convicted in remote control bombing of Bear Country First National Bank, head of Huff and Puff Gang, highly intelligent, has expert knowledge of computers, 
Further information on wanted members of Huff and Puff Gang available upon request. With that knowledge, busting the perps is a cinch. J. Arthur Bruin, Puff, is the inside man coordinating the operation from inside Bear Country State Prison. Huff and the rest of the gang are nabbed outside Grizzly Mansion. In a news interview about the bust, Police Chief Bruno singles out Teacher Bob's class, and specifically his own daughter, Babs, as the ones responsible for bringing down the Huff and Puff gang. I'm sure there will be no violent reprisals. But back up a second. How was J. Arthur Bruin able to coordinate this whole thing from behind bars? It was quite a scheme, really. It turns out that this Bruin fellow is a real computer expert. So much that he was put in charge of the whole prison computer system. Well, there's your mistake right there. Never put an inmate in charge of the prison computer network unless he agrees to blacklist the young poet's chat room. Squire Grizzly's laptop program is shut down after report cards come out, and it becomes obvious that the internet has turned Teacher Bob's class into a passel of underachieving dunces. The reason was obvious. It was clear to Teacher Bob that most of the class spent so much time on their laptops with chat rooms, computer games, websites, and goodness knows what else, they didn't have any time left over for schoolwork. Yeah, goodness knows what else. Probably angling for a huge tax write-off, Squire Grizzly proposes another technology grant. Instead of personal laptops, he will provide the school with a modern computer lab that the students can use for an hour a day. Which is still a huge chunk of the school day. I mean, deep in the 21st century, the kids at my school have computer class for just 40 minutes a week. But the plan works, and without their Chromebooks melting their brains, the Cubs go back to healthy activities like playing baseball and going to the movies. As a parent, I've never been happier than when my children ask their friends over for an internet computer party. So how does a 1999 book about the internet written by a couple of senior citizens hold up today? Well, it's clear that Stan and Jan knew bugger all about digital footprints, the surveillance state, or even the basics of email. There's a part early in the book when a message from Teacher Bob appears on the students' laptops, and it's signed with his website address, www.teachbob.edu. Apologies for nitpicking, but edu is generally reserved for universities. If Bear Country Central School District were to have a website, a Teacher Bob's email would probably be tbob at bccsd.org. There are also some logistical inconsistencies with the whole laptop pilot program. Evidently, none of the families has been notified that their children will be receiving laptops. In fact, almost no one has any idea what laptops are or what the internet itself is until Teacher Bob explains it to them, and yet every family somehow has internet access at home. Even Wi-Fi, judging by the lack of cords in this picture. The students are also required to print and submit hard copies of their homework, which may seem to defeat the purpose of a digital learning platform, but remember, it's 1999. TeachBob.edu probably lacks the technical sophistication of Google Classroom. To his credit, Teacher Bob proves to be one of the more sensible and level-headed characters in this story. He expresses the most balanced views on the pros and cons of the internet and stresses the importance of online safety. He gives his students a pamphlet titled Rules of the Cyberspace Road, which boils down to don't give strangers your real name and don't meet online friends in real life unless an adult goes with you. Of course, after imparting this valuable lesson, the book immediately damages its own credibility by showing how anyone can flout Teacher Bob's safety rules and not suffer any consequences. Queenie McBear, the class diva, signs up for an online dating service at the urging of her older cousin, Bermuda. Let's remember that Queenie is, at most, 13 years old. She arranges a date with an older guy she doesn't know, and Bermuda gives her a makeover so that she can look... er... drop-dead downtown sensational? <coughs> Yikes. Queenie goes to the pizza shack for her romantic rendezvous, only to discover that her date is her own boyfriend, Too Tall Grizzly. If you like pina coladas. There you go, kids. Nothing bad will happen if you lie about your age on a dating site and meet an internet stranger without telling your parents. 
you'll just have a good laugh. I happened to post an ad actually to one of the listservs um, called Alt Personals. And I had about 40 people answer my ad. Men. If the Berensteins seem out of their depth when it comes to the internet, it's only fair to compare them with their contemporaries, if not their intellectual peers. Clifford Stoll is an astronomer, teacher, and tech icon. He was a pioneer of the early internet and famously led an investigation into what may have been the first documented case of internet espionage, resulting in the capture of a KGB asset who had been stealing US military secrets. Stoll has the air of a mad scientist or a nutty professor. If anyone in the 1990s was qualified to speculate on the impact of the World Wide Web, it was Clifford Stoll. Which makes it all the more ironic that this man wrote an article for Newsweek in 1995 titled, The Internet? Bah! In it, Stoll dismisses many of the promised conveniences and breakthroughs of the fledgling World Wide Web. For instance, responding to a prediction that we'll soon buy books and newspapers straight over the internet, Stoll says, uh, sure. In what has since become an internet classic, Stoll goes on to ridicule a string of predictions that would all one day come true. Then there's cyber business. We're promised instant catalog shopping. Just point and click for great deals. We'll order airline tickets over the network. Make restaurant reservations and negotiate sales contracts. Stores will become obsolete. So how come my local mall does more business in an afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? Even if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism. Salespeople. Stoll went on to fill two entire books, Silicon Snake Oil and High Tech Heretic, with similarly myopic predictions about the internet. Here's just a sample. Unlike books, computers have street value. Plenty of kids have been mugged for their lunch money. Schoolyard bullies and neighborhood punks sure won't ignore the second grader with a portable computer. Assigning valuable objects to school children makes the kids walking targets. I promise you, a second grader's grimy Chromebook is the last thing anybody is going to try to steal. What pressing problem does electronic distance learning solve? Serious? Computer experts waste enormous resources by making grandiose predictions. Push technology would magically download the information we needed before we even asked for it. Network computers would work without disks by hooking up directly over the internet. Electronic commerce, based on cryptographic payment systems, would bring a whole new model for doing business. Intelligent agents would filter our mail, pick our movies, and tell us where to shop. Our lives would be revolutionized by social interfaces, interactive television, and resource visualization. All came to naught. Hmm. It, you know, it's amazing. You are 100% wrong. I mean, nothing you've said has been right. Information isn't power. Information isn't money either. <laughs> more and more science projects simply show computer animations of someone else's experiment. We'll show students animated test tubes, yet won't ask them to actually mix and taste vinegar and baking soda. Mix and taste? Okay. It's tempting to write this guy off as a Luddite and a curmudgeon, but I don't think he's either. In 2010, when his poorly aged article was getting some renewed attention, he was a good sport about it and remarked that he's much more careful nowadays about tempering his predictions. It just goes to show how difficult it is even for alleged experts to accurately forecast as little as 5 or 10 years into the future. So let's cut the Berenstein some slack. Lost in Cyberspace could easily have been called OK Boomer, but who knows, in 1999 it might have seemed savvy and relevant. He thinks he's amusing. He's in for a bruising. I'm not nice like my mom. I'll send him a bomb. MB. Did... did you guys see that? 
I didn't even know my channel had ads. You can type what we call a smiley. Here's one. But now just turn your head sideways and you can see how it works. Okay. Technical inaccuracy aside, this book is hardly unique in its insanity compared with the other big chapter books. In fact, I should mention that there are actually two lines of Berenstein Bear chapter books. The first is the big chapter books, which we've been discussing this whole time. Their keystone is the slightly grown-up cubs grappling with real-world issues like cybercrime and peer pressure. The second is the Berenstein Bear Scouts. These books focus on brother, sister, Lizzie, and Fred who have to solve crimes as the bear detectives. Yeah, I know the series is literally called The Bear Scouts, but in almost every book, some kind of eco-terrorism or Lovecraftian horror is being perpetrated on bear country, and the cubs have to become the bear detectives to save the day. It becomes even more confusing when they invariably do this three musketeers routine at the start of each mystery, the whole all for one and one for all bit. Like, make up your mind, are you scouts, detectives, or musketeers? In any case, the Bear Scout stories are, if anything, even more outlandish than the big chapter book stories. They often involve existential threats to bear kind. Just look at a couple of these titles. The Berenstein Bear Scouts and the Sci-Fi Pizza. The Berenstein Bear Scouts scream their heads off. There are some who believe the big chapter books and the Bear Scouts books comprise two different timelines or continuities, but I like to think of them as happening in the same universe. Together, the two series really peel back the idyllic facade of bear country presented in the first time books. Beneath it lies a dangerous world of crime, drama, and supernatural horror, sort of like a weird mashup of Saved by the Bell and Scooby-Doo. It's a shame there hasn't been a Berenstein Bear chapter book published since 2000. Mike Berenstein continues to crank out loads of Berenstein Bear books every year, but they're primarily early readers and religious stories. In this era of endless reboots, why can't we bring back the big chapter books? There are so many juicy topics from the past couple of decades just begging for the Berenstein treatment. What about a Bearvid 19 episode? I can see it now. After Grizzly Gramps contracts the first documented case of Barona virus, Bear Country goes on complete lockdown. Mayor Honeypot downplays the crisis and gins up resentment and violence by calling it the Panda virus. Professor Actual Factual urges mask wearing and social distancing. Papa Bear declares the whole thing piffle and refuses to mask up. He forms a group called Bears Against Repellent Face Masks and holds crowded indoor meetings to rail against the government. Mama and sister dutifully wear their masks. So does brother, but he maintains a shallow good people on both sides philosophy. That is, until teacher Bob, a healthy young man in the prime of life, contracts Bearvid at the grocery store and almost dies. Meanwhile, Ralph Ripoff secures a supply of horse dewormer from Farmer Ben and employs the Too Tall Gang to distribute it to his customers. After a vaccine garners a lukewarm reception from the general public, everyone decides they're tired of dealing with Bearvid and accepts that suffering and death are inevitable. Hello, darkness, my friend. Joking aside, I sincerely wish that Mike Berenstein would revive the big chapter books. Given the extreme commercialization of the Berenstein franchise, I'm sure the choice to discontinue them was purely economical, and I can't say that I blame either Mike Berenstein or his publishers. Speaking as a school librarian, I don't have a lot of confidence that today's kids would go for those books. The Berenstein Bears are one of those perfectly serviceable book series, kind of like Clifford or Arthur, that, for whatever reason, modern school-age readers largely ignore. So what do we need to do to get these chapter books going again? A massive Kickstarter campaign? I don't know how many of my fellow aging millennials would lighten their wallets to make this happen, but here are some things Mike Berenstein could do to reinvigorate the series. There should totally be a line of Berenstein Bear graphic novels. The back of every big chapter book advertised all the different genres that the series would encompass, from page-turning mysteries to boy-girl stories to action-packed sports stories. The only one they promised but never delivered on was the fun-to-read comic adventures. Maybe they just meant humorous stories, but I always interpreted comic adventures as, you know, comic books. 
A full-color Berenstein Bear graphic novel, or better yet, an entire series of them, would be incredible. The Space Grizzlies alone, from the Berenstein Bears and the Bad Dream, deserve their own spin-off. But if we want quality Berenstein Bear graphic novels, something else needs to be addressed. Mike Berenstein needs to focus on his artwork. I'm not entirely clear on the timeline, but it seems that he started collaborating with his parents in the late 90s. After Stan passed away in 2005, Mike assumed even more creative responsibility, and since Jan's death in 2012, he's been running the whole show. The untrained observer may not even be able to discriminate between Jan's artwork and Mike's, but to a lifelong reader, the difference couldn't be more obvious. Jan's illustration, while not artistically groundbreaking, was crisp, lively, and finished looking. When Mike began producing some of the artwork, at first I thought he was simply an inferior illustrator. His bears are just… off. I mean, seriously, look at this guy. Why does he have four big window panes for teeth? The colors are less vibrant. The line work is… garbage. Sometimes he doesn't even erase his sketch lines. Look at this. This drawing of the burger bear makes no sense spatially. There's no detail whatsoever, and there are sketch lines all over the place. Other times, there are no sketch lines to erase because I'm convinced some of these drawings are done in a single take, so to speak. No plan, no sketch, no reference material, just a few minutes worth of hurried pencil work. The big chapter books are in a class of their own because even though they're novels, there is still at least one drawing on every page. That was one of their selling points. But sometimes there just isn't anything exciting happening on each page, so you get a lot of these illustrations of bears simply repeating the dialogue you've just read in the text. Here's a drawing of Two Tall Grizzly saying, I got ways, sweet cakes. But I don't think Mike is a bad artist. He's just rushed. In all fairness, many of his spreads are well executed and fun to look at. It's just that his publishing schedule must be so tight he can't invest the time that each illustration calls for. So I think he should ditch the early readers and the entire religious line and just focus on chapter books and graphic novels. So what kinds of fresh new Berenstein Bear stories are waiting to be told? Well, I've already outlined the Bear Vid episode, which would probably be titled The Berenstein Bears Sneeze Their Heads Off. There could also be The Berenstein Bears Save Bearambe, The Berenstein Bears and Bear Lives Matter, the Berenstein Bears and the Me Too movement, the Berenstein Bears and the War on Bearer, and the Berenstein Bears and the problem with pronouns. There's a lot to work with. And to be honest, Lost in Cyberspace could use a 21st century update that addresses social media, influencers, video game streaming, piracy, ransomware, cryptocurrency, fake news, and conspiracy theories. Also, I would love to read stories where the cubs are even older, going through college, getting married, having cubs of their own. What would they be named? Son and daughter bear? Grandson and granddaughter bear? Brother junior and… well, it wouldn't be sister junior, but… These could be full-length 400-page novels, and I promise you I would gobble them right up. Make spin-off novels that focus on some of the adult characters like Farmer Ben or Officer Marguerite. How about some prequel stories about the childhoods of Grizzly Gramps and Gran and Mrs. Grizzle? What about genre fiction like a crime thriller featuring Ugly Bear Johnson? If you want sci-fi or fantasy, Bear Trek and Bear of the Rings canonically exist in the Berenstein universe and are just waiting for the novelizations they deserve. Or how about this? In the Berenstein Bears Big Bedtime book, human beings are confirmed to exist in the Berenstein universe. Mrs. Grizzle tells brother and sister the story of Goldie Bear and the three people. Brother says he doesn't believe in people, and sister says she thinks they're scary. Don't worry, says Mrs. Grizzle. None of them live around here. That's ominous as hell, and there needs to be a horror story where the bears make first contact with human beings. Oh.
This episode began as a critique of Lost in Cyberspace, but you might have noticed that I got a little caught up in the Berenstein universe at large. In fact, less than half the pages of my script even address Lost in Cyberspace. I said at the beginning that I wouldn't be able to cover the entire Berenstein legendarium from stem to stern. If you really want that, I vigorously recommend the podcast Deep in Bear Country by Phil Gonzalez. It covers every Berenstein bear book ever published in extraordinary detail. If my deep dive into the Berenstein universe was the equivalent of a professional scuba dive, Phil Gonzalez's podcast scrapes the bottom of the Challenger deep. Like me, he's not afraid to poke fun here and there, but through it all shines his deep love and respect for the Berenstein Bears. Which I hope is what comes through with this episode of my show. I've taken some good-natured digs at the Bears, but again, on the vanishingly small chance that Mike Berenstein ever sees this episode, I really hope he understands it's all in good fun, and I would never want to give the impression that... Oh, that's probably my latest delivery. I really don't like leaving packages unattended on my porch. I'll be right back. All right, uh, now what, what was I saying? Well, anyway, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, happy reading and use a bookmark. Huh, there's a note here. You poked fun at my story. It's about to get gory. You should hit the road. Your house is going to explode. MB. Wow, this is getting really personal now. I just can't figure out who MB is and why he would want to... Oh no.